Od Sheva, Israel National TV, and Or Olam, the Center for Biblical Zionism, present Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. We have a special show tonight. We have Jews from all across America and all throughout the English-speaking world who have joined us here in Jerusalem to celebrate Pesach as one nation in our homeland. Everyone here tonight has taken time off their vacation, whether they live in Israel, whether they live in America, taken time out of their free time to come out. And as we all celebrate the holiday of freedom, we're remembering one man who has lost his freedom. Tonight, the show is dedicated and in honor of Jonathan Pollard. A, a Yemenite friend of mine was telling me, a Yemenite friend, a Yemenite guy, they have very strange customs. They make Ketniot look normal. He was telling me about a custom that he has in his home. And they take the afikom in the middle mats, so they put it in a bag, they sling it over, over their shoulder, they have a suitcase, a briefcase, and they actually reenact the exodus from Egypt because the rabbis tell us that we are supposed to see ourselves as if we were slaves in Egypt. Now, this Pesach, I think not only should we see ourselves and identify with our ancestors, but with our brothers who this very day, at this moment, don't have their own freedom. We should see ourselves, let's just try to really see ourselves as Jonathan Pollard right now in his freezing cold prison cell in Butner, North Carolina. This is his 24th Passover that he spent in this prison cell. It's 24 Passovers. He was raised, we, we were raised in Texas, in a modern Orthodox home that I can do. I'm from Texas, I'm still there. We, you know, our father was a, a decorated soldier in, in the army. He, he also fought, he was a loyal. So we excelled in school. We did everything we possibly could and we were accepted to Stanford University. For me, that's a little bit of a stretch, maybe Stanford Community College. That's as far as I would go. He's accepted, and he excels, and he's asked to be in the American Naval Intelligence. And he's honored to do it, and he says yes. So he starts, and just a few years after starting this job, he becomes privy to information. And what do we find out? We find out that Iraq, and Iran and Libya and Syria, they have nuclear, chemical, biological weapons that are being developed to use against Israel. We find out about the ballistic missiles and about terrorist attacks that are being planned against Israeli civilians. Now you have to understand that there is a memorandum agreement between the United States and Israel where they're supposed to share this information, but the U.S. is not sharing it with Israel at all. So what do we do? We go to our officers, to our superiors, and we say, let's share this with Israel. They need to know this. And the officers turn a deaf ear. They say, mind your own business. Jews get paranoid when they hear about poison gas. So what do we do? We're in a very difficult predicament, in a, in a challenging dilemma. We do our research, and we see that the median prison sentence for spying for an ally is between two and four years. That seems like a small price to pay to prevent another Holocaust, which is exactly what Jonathan Pollard said he was there to do, to prevent another Holocaust. Would you do it? I know that I would do it, and I'm sure that most people in this audience would do it as well. But what actually happened was a nightmare. Pollard was caught, and he agreed to cooperate with the government for a plea agreement. He kept his part of the bargain, but when it came time to sentencing, they gave him a full life sentence and recommended no parole. Forget two to four years. He spent the first seven years in solitary confinement. There were spies who spied against the United States for hostile countries, harming the United States' best interests, putting them in danger, in grave danger, and they didn't even receive such a harsh punishment. Before the show, we had stacks, piles of documents that we went through. We wanted to be well versed on the facts and the situation. What really happened with Pollard? I mean, we were underlining, marking, taking notes. I felt like I was back in law school cramming for a final. 
with all of the truths and all of the tr untruths that are out there, this entire issue boils down to one issue. Justice. Jonathan Pollard was a man who risked his job, who risked his life, who risked his freedom to protect the Jewish people in the land of Israel. He came across information that was vital to Israel's security. He came across information that America promised in a memorandum that they would give to Israel. It was a matter of life and death and Jonathan Pollard needed to make a choice. He had to decide life or death and he put his life on the line to protect our lives. None of the information that I provided Israel, none of it, dealt with U.S. codes, agents, their identity, location, military hardware, war plans, intelligence collection devices, or forced dispositions. A life sentence from an allied country? This isn't about loyalties between Israel and America. This is about justice. That's not just. That's not fair. And the Jewish people, we've always been on the front lines of justice. In the 1960s, we spearheaded rallies in Mississippi, protesting for black rights. Even today, Jews march for Darfur with the atrocities that are happening there. And right now, it's time for the Jewish people to stand up and say it's time to free Jonathan Pollard. And next year, we want Jonathan Pollard to be on our TV show and not a show about his TV show. The Jewish people, we only have ourselves. We only have ourselves. If we don't stand up for ourselves, no one else will. Jonathan. We know that you're going to see this. We want you to see the hundreds of Jews from all across the world that have come here during Pesach to be with you, to stand with you. We support you and we thank you. And we want you to know that the Jews of Jerusalem that are here in Pesach, next year, Shana Habab Yerushalayim, we're going to be together. Now we're fortunate to have with us the director of Israel National Radio, a fierce advocate for Jonathan Pollard, taking the Pollard issue from being fringe and making it mainstream where it belongs. Yishai Fleischer. Woo! Happy holiday, everybody. Chag Sameach. I had a great day today. Can I tell you, I, I was in Jerusalem. I live in Beit El. I went to Jerusalem today, as you're supposed to. You know, the Bible tells us, come to Jerusalem three times a year for the festivals. All right, I got to, I went down to the Kotel Plaza, suddenly I meet a friend there, he says, come to my parents' apartment. He takes me to this unbelievable apartment with a view right over the Western Wall. Oh man, I prayed off the balcony to God Almighty. And I'm eating, they're feeding me a little food, and I'm thinking to myself, this is just awesome. And then I'm thinking to myself, you know, I have a show tonight about Jonathan Pollard, and suddenly it dawns on me, what is my view, what is his view? He's looking out of grimy prison walls in Butler, North Carolina. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I am so lucky. And probably I'm lucky to be here because of him. And he's eating it. And he's living this awful life over there. I was just like, whew. And I went to another apartment with a view on the old, old city, the whole old city of Jerusalem. And again, where are you, Jonathan? And then I went to another apartment with a view on all of Jerusalem. And I'm thinking, wow, I am the luckiest guy in this world. Where are you, Jonathan? This is the way we live if we're conscious <clears throat> of our brothers. If we're not conscious of our brothers, we don't care. We just talk about me. I'm having a great time. But when you're a person, Jew and non-Jew alike, and when you care about truth, then you feel the pain of another person. Okay, that's what I was thinking about, Jonathan Pollard. I want to tell you something. I'm a proud Israeli. Yes, that might sound a little weird, okay? People say, pride is not good. Israeli, I don't know, maybe you're Jewish. I'm a proud Israeli. And the reason I'm a proud Israeli is because in my mind, an Israeli is a Jew living in the land of Israel. Bnei Israel, I'm Israel, the nation of Israel. And you know what? And you know what? Being an Israeli means having a certain set of values that we even didn't know about when we were just Jewish out in the exile. When we're back in the land, we have another set of values. For example, I was a soldier, as these guys were as well, in the IDF. I'm very proud to be a Jewish soldier in the land of Israel. And you know one of those values is? You don't leave a soldier lying the in the field. You don't do that. 
You don't let that's fundamental. It's a tenet. You don't mess with that. That's just that's just part of Israeli ethos. Okay, you don't leave a man down. We have units dedicated to bringing pilots that are down. Special units just dedicated to this very idea of bringing a soldier back. We don't leave people in the field. And what's this? And what's this? Our agent, our fellow Jewish hero, he's left in the field. I am shamed to be an Israeli when I think about Jonathan Pollard. And that's okay. It might, it might sound like a harsh word, but you know, that kind of shame is fixable, remedable. And I want to tell you that I am also a former American. I still have an American passport. And I think to myself, the only reason that we don't give America a harder time is because America is our friend. It's our friend. Well, let me tell you, I got a piece of news. A friend, a real friend, tells the other friend when he's being bad. That's what a real friend is. A friend isn't a guy who pats you on the back and says, you're great. A friend's like, hey, you're a little bit off the road. You're off your path, man. And there's a path enumerated in the Declaration of Independence. It's called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. It's based on Locke, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Property. Life, Liberty, and Property. Is this an American value? To hold a person in prison like this? When he doesn't deserve it? When it's an unjust cause, a mis miscarriage of justice? Is this an American value that we were taught? How am I supposed to build a better country here in Israel if the value system that I was taught in America is flawed? So you know what? When I think about Jonathan Pollard, I'm embarrassed to be an American as well. And you know what? With one fell swoop, with one little act, we can fix both of these things. We can return both these nations back to their value system. Just bring them home. We'll feel good. They'll feel good. We'll, we'll think to ourselves, oh boy, we brought justice to this world. We, we lived a life of truth. We didn't let Jonathan Pollard, God forbid, die in prison. And we won't, ladies and gentlemen. We will not let him die in prison. It's just that easy. Just let him go. I was fortunate to sit down this past week with Caroline Glick. She's a brilliant columnist for the Jerusalem Post. I read her religiously. Tremendous insights. She's able to analyze what's happening here and is a real voice of truth. She actually credits her aliyah to Israel to the Jonathan Pollard affair. She was in high school when it happened and she said, oh my goodness, when one's loyalties are threatened or questioned, one has to make a decision. And she made her decision and she moved to the land of Israel. I want you to hear what she has to say. In 1985, Jonathan Pollard was sentenced to life in prison for selling Israel classified information. Was that a just punishment? The sentence against Pollard was um, very, very, uh, what was grossly disproportionate to the sentences that uh, people re received for being agents of countries that are friendly to the United States. In similar cases, when uh, American citizens transferred inter intelligence information or classified information to other allied states with the United States, like South Korea, for instance, their sentences uh, generally ranged of, uh, to up to five years. So yes, um, Pollard's sentence was grossly disproportionate to comparable uh, crimes committed by other American citizens on behalf of countries that are friendly and allied with the United States. So why is Jonathan Pollard still in prison? I mean, he got a life in prison sentence and I think he's up for parole in about 10 years or something like that. And uh, the only way, given the fact that he has minimal 30 years, I think, to serve in prison before he's even eligible for parole is for the president to give him a presidential pardon and no president since his conviction has has done so that's why he's still in prison why is it in the US's interest to keep Jonathan Pollard in prison former director of central intelligence uh, James Woolsey told me after I met with Pollard in 2005 that he believes that maintaining Pollard's imprisonment is antithetical to U.S. national interest because the United States and Israel are now fighting the war against the exact same enemies of the global jihad and therefore since the United States has an interest in strengthening its strategic alliance with Israel at this time of war uh, the United States should have uh, should should um, um, pardon Pollard and he should be allowed to leave prison but that's that's a general U.S. interest 
there are people in the United States who have an interest in maintaining Pollard in prison for the same reason that they had an interest in ensuring that he got a disproportionately large and harsh sentence when he was convicted in 1985. And these people are people in the uh, FBI and in the administration who feel that uh, basically for anti-Semitic reasons that Jews are not trustworthy and that American Jews form some sort of fifth column against you, American national interests. It's generally a view that is propagated by anti-Semites and, and maintained by anti-Semites. And um, that's a very strong, there's a very strong echo of that sentiment still in the halls of power in Washington. As a soldier in the Israeli army, one of the fundamental principles we know is never leave a fellow soldier out in the field. Why isn't Israel doing more and making it a real point of contention with the United States to fight for Pollard's release? Israel is behaving like a coward in all of this. I think, um, you know, it's a sense that uh, uh, we're not good enough for the Americans, that uh, we have to somehow or another curry favor with them in order to make them uh, be nice to us, not because of respect, but because of uh, pity. And I think that the attempt of Israel to uh, distance itself from Pollard for so many years, and even today, and under Ariel Sharon, under Sharon and Omer in Israel has done absolutely nothing to try to get Pollard released from prison. I think it's because they have this mentality, which is, is really the mentality of people who are not free. In 2005, you went and visited Jonathan Pollard in prison. What was that visit like? Does he feel betrayed? It was uh, horrible. I mean, I, I, left, uh, I left the prison in North Carolina. I don't remember feeling more traumatized by just about anything that I've seen. I cried for two days after I met him. It was just so horrible because really his plight goes to the very core of what Israel was supposed to end, which is Jewish humiliation and Jewish persecution. Um, he believes that he feels very betrayed by Israel and he feels betrayed by American Jews who have also done next to nothing to try to get him out. Do Jews around the world have a responsibility and an obligation to fight to secure Pollard's release? And if so, what can they do? The Jews of the world really should be standing up to our own leaders and telling them that this is what we demand. I think Pollard's imprisonment, in a way, imprisons every single one of us because the fact that he remains in prison and the fact that our leaders refuse to raise the issue of his continued confinement with the Americans in any of their conversations with, with them uh, shows that uh, Israel too has yet to fulfill the promise of our establishment and of our founding. Tonight we have a special guest with us. We have Jonathan Pollard's wife with us, Esther Pollard. Before the show, of course, we spoke with her. And it's, she's a woman that's consumed with sadness, consumed with pain, consumed with hurt, regret, all of this pain. And we wanted to show the other side, the human side, not the stats, not the statistics, but to show the human side of what's happening. Because at the end of the day, this is someone's life. It's a family that's being destroyed. And so please, everyone, welcome Esther Pollard. <laughs> Esther, thank you so much for coming. We want to start by asking you a question that really only you can answer. You know, you can't we'll see this on the news. How is Jonathan doing? Oh. You know, it's, it's a very, very hard question to answer because there's really two facets to it. Um, practically speaking, he's in terrible shape. Um, he's physically um, worn out. He's suffering from a, a, a number of physical illnesses and ailments, any, any one of which could kill you. Um, he's suffering 
not only from all the physical ailments, but from the terrible, terrible, terrible angst of another case of in prison. Um, the hurt, the disappointment, the failure of the Israeli government to articulate a case to bring him home uh, for Pesach. In fact, just the opposite. The, the active efforts of, of people like Ehud Olmert to, to ensure that he remains in prison. So that, that really hurts. Um, and then you've got the opposite side of the coin, the spiritual side, uh, and that is the very fact that Jonathan is still alive after 23 years of the worst torture and affliction and, and just the, 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 the sheer weight of time is nothing but an absolute and complete miracle. So we're living on miracles day by day. Well, could you tell us what is a day like? A day by day, what is his day like in prison? Solitary confinement, he's in he's maximum, a, maximum security prison. He's not in, he's not in solitary. Um, he's, uh, he's been, he's, he spent the first seven years in solitary confinement. Um, currently he's an, he's an open population with its um, violence, anti-Semitism, um, filth, noise, constant noise, um, 24-7. It's, it's a very, very dehumanizing experience. Um, we've been told by an NSA, friendly NSA officials, friendly National Security Agency officials, that even they are amazed that Jonathan has survived. Um, one such official told me that what kills an agent, an abandoned agent like Jonathan, um, is not so much the, the violence, the threat from, from other prisoners. What kills is when they lose hope. When the years go by and they see that they've been abandoned and they see that nobody cares, they, you know, a, a, an agent loses hope, loses hope of the truth ever coming out. He can get a cold and, and, the, and the infection can kill. Uh, he can get a splinter and, and, and die. Um, but it, you know, it, it, it's the good people like you who are here tonight and who care and, and, and who are um, actively involved in seeking Jonathan's release that, that are giving him the hope and the will to carry on. Um, one of the things that, that impressed me about your program, I, I began to go through old copies of the program to see what I was getting into tonight. One of the things that impressed me is what a deeply, deeply spiritual program this is. Um, yes, it's entertainment, but at the same time, it, it goes right to the heart of the spirit of Jerusalem. And I thought, well, maybe that's what we should be talking about tonight also in the Polly case, not just what's happening to Jonathan, but what's happening to us as a nation, as a people, because of the Pollock case, because of the failure of our leadership to articulate, as you said so, so well, justice for one of our own. Um, and it, it's, it's inevitable, you know, after 23 years, which, you know, I keep saying in the Israeli press that that's more than five times the, 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 the usual sentence the usual sentence for what Jonathan did, one count of passing classified information to an ally, is two to four years. Jonathan's been there for 23 years. After 23 years, every single top American official who knows the case, who knows the file, is now on record calling for Jonathan's release. So how is it that the government of Israel can't manage to secure Jonathan's release? You have people like James Wolsey, the former head of the CIA, calling for Jonathan's release. You have people like Senator Dennis DeConcini, who was the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee when Jonathan was arrested, and, and who, who knows the whole case. Since 1996, he's been saying it's time to let Polly go. Um, you have people like Dennis Ross, who, who um, was a former special envoy to the Middle East, saying it's time to let Polly go. Over and over again, any official who knows this case says it's time to let Polly go. And yet from Jerusalem, we get excuses like, oh, it's in Subach. It's complicated, and we can't, and it's political. Um, one of the things that, that held me up tonight, and, and I know gave your producers kind of a nervous headache, um, there's, a, there's Kavyechol, as it were, a breaking news story tonight in the American media. Um, and they're, they're claiming that they think that they found another Israeli spy in America. Have you ever noticed that every few years this happens? The last time was uh, just a few years ago, 
uh, maybe 10 years ago, where they had the mega spy scandal, they found a new spy. And the conclusion was, of course, in Jerusalem, that Paul should stay in prison forever because they found a new spy in America. Do you think so crazy? I've, I've been inundated with media tonight, Israeli media. I've been interviewing nonstop because they think they found another spy, another Israeli spy in America. So, of course, Jonathan can never go free. Would someone like to tell me the logic? Let me assure you, since, since we have the opportunity tonight, let me assure you that there, if indeed this propaganda turns out to have some substance, which I've never seen happen before, there is absolutely no connection between America's new suspicions and Jonathan Pollard. There is no connection to the 23 years that Jonathan's already served. There's no connection whatsoever to the demand that our Prime Minister has to make that it's time to bring Jonathan Pollard home now in time for Israel's 60th anniversary. Us as the people, not as the Israeli leadership, what can we do? What can we do to help? Every single one of us is going to have to give an account someday Jonathan is, as his name sounds, Yeho Natan, God's gift. He's an amazing man who has stayed alive against all odds to give us, the Jewish people, the opportunity to come together, to show unity, and to redeem ourselves by redeeming him. Everyone here can do something, whether it's prayer, whether it's holding elected officials responsible, whether it's writing letters, you know who you know, you know what your connections are, you know what your possibilities are. Whether it's uh, demonstrating, whether it's going and, and, and going to the media. You know who you know in the media. You know, um, Americans uh, are famous, by the way, I know this program reaches, reaches Americans. Americans are, uh, Jews are famous for funding uh, American presidential candidates. How is it, going through five American elections, Jonathan Pollard has never been an election issue? He's been buried alive for 23 years, subjected to cruel and unusual punishment, and somehow the Jews have failed to make him an election issue? What's going on here? Everyone can do something. Ask yourself what it is you do best and start. Everyone should be praying for Jonathan. And, and, that, and that's, that, that's the very first place. There shouldn't be a minion in this country or in, in, in America that doesn't have Jonathan Pollard as a regular Misha Berach every single time it happens. Thank you so much. Would you like to say something to the people in Israel back home? Yes. Please. Um, over the past few years, um, one of the main sources of support, both my wife Esther and I, uh, have had is the kind of outpouring of support from the people from every walk of life from every part of the country uh, from every faction from every political grouping from every ideology imaginable right now more than anything else we have to understand that this kind of unity that's been exhibited towards me both within the government and within the population as a whole is needed on a whole host of issues. If factions and interests can set aside their differences and come together to form a unified position based on principle for me, we can do the same thing for other issues in the country. As you just saw, Esther Pollard is a woman in pain. Part of her has been in prison for 24 years. 23 years, and justifiably so, you can imagine what that pain is like. You can imagine the agony. She feels betrayed. She feels betrayed not only by the American government, but by the Israeli government. She feels betrayed by world Jewry, who by and large either ignore or avoid the issue of Jonathan Pollard, either because they don't know the details, they just are not able to learn, or they're afraid. They're afraid that if they fight for Jonathan Pollard, it will cast into doubt questions about their own loyalty, their own patriotism. Dennis Prager, he's a famous talk show host in America, radio show host, someone called in and asked him, Dennis, are you a Jew first or an American first? He said, I'll answer that question, but first you answer. 
first, are you a Christian? The man said, yes. He says, well, are you a Christian first or an American first? He says, I am an American first. Dennis Prager then said, well, then you're not a good American and you're not a good Christian. Because America is not like the Soviet Union that takes the place of God, the Almighty. America is a nation founded under God, founded with principles of truth and justice and liberty. And if those principles are violated, it is your job as an American to fight for those principles and to fight America until it's returned to what it stands for. For the Jewish people, the Torah holds redemption of captives in the highest regard, the utmost importance and priority. We're supposed to even sell our Torah scrolls in order to redeem a captive. All of Israel is responsible for one another. It's a fundamental tenet of Judaism. We have printed up outside prayers written by Chief Rabbi Yona Metzger for Jonathan Pollard. For all of you who are from the exile to take and bring back to your community, to bring back to your congregation, to give to your rabbi and ask him to say this every single Shabbat. And I believe that when Hashem looks down at the Jewish people all around the world, who at the very least were praying for our captives. We're praying for Gilad Shalit and Goldwasser and Regev and for Jonathan Pollard all together. When he sees the unity and the love we have for each other, he will help us and give us strength and courage for the challenges that lay ahead. Shalom from Jerusalem. Desert sand took us out of Egypt down. Brought us 